This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. To learn more or to subscribe, visit beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer Bring Podcast. I'm Jamie Bogner, and this week's episode takes us to coastal Delaware for my absolute favorite brewing event of the year, our annual brewer's retreat. Over three days, we make beer together, we enjoy beer together, we learn together, we pair food and beer together, and together we discuss how some of our featured brewers, who we count among some of the very best brewers in the world, make the beer that has earned them such esteem. This year's retreat at Dogfish Head in Milton, Rehoboth Beach, and Lewis, Delaware just finished up earlier this week, but the memories, uh, they are still locked at the front of my brain, um, and I am still just overcome with how incredible and inspiring those few days were. So wanted to get this first to two episodes out as quickly as possible. If you want to get an idea of what it's like, check out the social feeds, Craft Beer Brewing, Dogfish Head, Russian River, Burial, and others for loads of videos and pictures. And in that same vein, I wanted to share this panel discussion that we held first thing Monday morning. Sam Calagione took half of the assembled brewers on a tour of the brewery while I sat down for a direct fire Q&A session on West Coast IPA with Vinny Chalurza of Russian River, Chris Johnson of Green Bench, and Doug Reeser of Burial. I asked some questions, of course, but the real fun uh, is in this Q&A as everyone in the audience got a chance to pick the brewing brains of these three smart and influential brewers. Before we jump into the conversation at G&D Chillers, they always strive to build great chillers. Partner with them as you build great beer, but don't just take my word for it. This is Andy Joint of Big Grove Brewery. We've been using G&D chillers from the beginning and from our original three and a half barrel pub system up to our production brewery. We've been able to rely on G&D to provide a high quality chiller, help us with design and layout and provide support whenever we need it. That's right. Choose G&D chillers on your next expansion or brewery startup and receive one free year of remote control and monitoring of your new G&D chiller. And ProBrew is excited to now offer two to four week lead times on all in-stock ProFill rotary can fillers and seamers. These models are available in 100 to 300 can per minute filling speeds and are built with a focus on scalability and low dissolved oxygen pickup. This special lead time is only while supplies last, so send them an email, contact us at probrew.com, or call them at 262-278-4945. ProBrew, brew your beer. Also, are you struggling to source affordable citrus ingredients due to market fluctuations? Try Old Orchard's flavored craft juice concentrate blends, which mimic straight concentrates at a better price point and with a more reliable supply. Old Orchard's citrus flavored blends include blood orange, grapefruit, lemonade, lime, and tangerine. To learn more and request your free samples, head on over to oldorchard.com slash brewer. Now, on to our West Coast IPA discussion from the Brewers Retreat. How's everybody doing this morning? Like I said earlier, we want to do this with questions for you. We are recording this. We'll probably put it out there on the podcast feed. So be thinking about your questions. I'm going to kick things off with a question for Vinny. Last year at the Brewers Retreat, we made an IPA. Some of the processes that you used in working on that IPA, dry hop and whatnot, actually then are the same kinds of techniques and approaches that you pushed into Pliny for president this year. A beer we'll have tomorrow night at the pairing dinner. Um, what did you learn from that process? And talk about some of what you have started incorporating in that as this uh, you know, kind of special different approach and how that has fed into your approach to IPA. Yeah, so um, we made an IPA last year as one of the two beers. Um, and you can actually tie back the dry hop technique, the first dry hop technique uh, that I actually learned from uh, Kelsey McNear, who's here from North Park. Um, and that uh, was something that we actually talked about on the first West Coast IPA podcast that uh, Kelsey and uh, Evan from Green Cheek and, and I did a couple years ago now. And that was pretty much to take, you know, we brewed the beer and the IPAs we brewed were pretty straightforward. Um, much like today, there'll be hops that you you know we can select from uh, that Roy Farms has has brought in. Um, for my team, I brought some hops as well. Um, anyways, uh, but then when it got to the dry hop, that technique is taking these high oil, uh, what we call high oil hop extracts. Uh, these are um, it's kind of like applying cannabis extraction techniques to hops, where they're doing it um, at different. Uh, 
temperatures, I believe. And in short, we're retaining those oils more. And this is a Whirlpool product that uh, now has a name uh, called Dino Boost, uh, used to be called YCH702, where we added it to the wort uh, at knockout. So uh, after we all brewed the threads last year, I took that wort into the pilot brewery, pushed it into a fermenter, added the yeast, but also dumped in some of this high oil uh, hop extract um, that is called Dino Boost from, from YCH. Um, Haas has their own version of it. Um, then there uh, is Steiner has their version. Uh, there's Abstracts, which uh, Roy Farms, who's here, uh, represents and sells uh, Abstracts. I can talk about that in a second. Uh, but these are like super ultra concentrated aromatics that you can add. Uh, the the Dino Boost is supposed to go into the Whirlpool, um, but Kelsey's technique is to actually add it uh, in the uh, fermenter because you end up having this lily pad floating effect, uh, especially if you do a cool pool where you cool the wort down um, a little bit in your whirlpool and then make the addition. Uh, Yakima Chief also makes a hyper boost, uh, which is basically an even more concentrated uh, oil that goes into the, uh, could be dry hopped. Um, really what we found is you can use these things. Um, the, the hyper boost uh, is, mostly dry hop at the Dino Boost, um, which is why CH702 could go in the Whirlpool and uh, or the dry hop. Uh, why do we do this? It gives a super raw, intense uh, hop uh, character. Um, it really leaves this fullness uh, in there uh, when used with pellets. You can't just use this stuff uh, on, on its own. Um, the caveat here is I don't know that it's available yet uh, for home brewers. Um, I believe the smallest size we're buying is one liter uh, or one kilo, kilo. so 2.2 2, 2 uh, pound containers. Um, but I'll then bring up the um, Abstracts, uh, Quantum Bright. Abstracts is a cannabis uh, company, and they're now creating uh, this very flowable uh, extract called Quantum Bright, where they extract it, they distill it, and then they emulsify it with sunflower oil and it <clears throat> flows like like water um, and it has some crazy aroma very rich and bright um, very true to type i actually brought some so we can uh, smell them later uh, when we're all down down brewing and just to tie it back to what jamie asked we then took what I learned from Kelsey, applied it to a few one-off beers, applied it to our craft beer and brewing IPA brewers retreat beer. And then that became a whole part of planning for president where we were adding the YCH 702 uh, at knockout to get this super intense uh, hop character. And then we carried on with dry hopping with concentrated pellets like cryo and CGX and, and, um, a lot of regular T90 pellets as well. So you do want to use these concentrated uh, hop oils in conjunction or hop extracts with pellets um, to some mix, at least 50, 50 percent. Chris, how have you worked these advanced hop products into your approach for IPA at, at Greenbench? Um, well, actually, it's pretty similar to what he said. I, I learned a lot um, by listening to the Craft Beer and Brewing magazine podcast. Um, yeah, actually Kelsey, oh, such a suck up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, he asked me to hop on this panel for that. So I think that's the reason I'm here just to say plug, plug craft beer and brewing. Right. Um, no, actually we use the, the same exact process that I did actually learn, uh, from Kelsey on the podcast originally. Um, I did it in a collaboration with a, with a brewery locally with, uh, with us it was the first time we tried it, but we, and we did the same thing. We used an incognito is usually what we use from Haas. Um, we'll add it into the fermenter, um, at knockout. We'll let that sit kind of warm for about Five, no more than about five minutes. Um, you know, we'll, we'll knock out kind of, you know, hotter than say full knockout temperature just to kind of um, let that blend a little bit in the cone. And then we'll knock out cold onto that. And then as we're knocking out, once our temperature gets down, then we'll add our yeast in line. Um, we have used those Flobo products in the kettle. Obviously, one of the issues that a lot of people have had, which is actually why I didn't use it, didn't continue using it until I heard about this sort of process, uh, Kelsey's process. Um, it just gets all inside of your kettle. It's hard to get out. You know, um, it sticks to the side. It's 
it's really, really sticky and oily. And um, obviously the fear of going through your heat exchanger and maybe having issues there. Um, I just wasn't really using them until I'd heard that process. And then in that collab, we did that. We just brewed a beer, um, an IPA back home. It came out last week um, and it was kind of similar as all pills. And then um, I think uh, it was a little bit of flaked rice, uh, like 10% or so. And then same process. We kind of hit it with like a little bit of first wort hopping and then um, didn't do flowable until knockout into the uh, to the fermenter. And one, one of the things that as a on the professional level in large batches that we're doing that we like for these uh, about these high oil hop extracts is one yield. So you get some yield back, which is great, even though these things uh, are expensive. Uh, so are hops. So we get more beer in the end. And then second, um, we're really working towards always working towards shelf stability, shelf uh, beer that has a longer uh, ab ability to s sit on the shelf cold. And if we can reduce more of the green matter, uh, that green matter has metals and metal ions in it and whatnot. And those things are oxidative in nature. And um, that's just from agricultural practices, from fertilizer, from the, just watering the, uh, the, the, the plants. And so we are trying to get to a point where we can reduce uh, green matter uh, and that will give us better shelf stability. It's one of the things we're looking at. Doug, let's talk about the burial evolution over the last year or two. Uh, where has your IPA adventure been taking burial uh, you know, in terms of process and ingredients over the last two years? Um, I, I think that we are constantly you know, toying with the fact that these beers cannot be the same at all. Like our processes have to be different. The things that we use have to be different. And so, you know, when you're driven by East Coast IPA sales, and that is, Typically, what our customers are asking for day in and day out, whether they're retail customers or wholesale customers, you know, that is clearly where most of your energy goes. And we are brewers, and so we want to drink West Coast IPA all the time, like every other brewery. And so, you know, we, <clears throat> we made that investment ourselves to make sure that we were isolating a lot of production space for those styles and replicating a lot of the hop products or the processes of hopping, whether it's hot side or cold side that we were doing with East Coast. And honestly, like in that period of time where we really spun up into West Coast again, because I, you know, when we started out, we we're West Coast and the East Coast took over and now it's back. And um, it, I, I feel like we, we were not very excited with the results, you know, like the, the process of trying to replicate the, the products that were working, the processes and products that were working in East Coast IPA just did not translate to comparing to the beers that Vinny or Kelsey made, right? Um, and so, you know, where we were focusing on utilizing, like, a lot of cryo that might provide a lot of, like, wonderful floral candy-like qualities, it doesn't make people happy as West Coast drinkers. They want resin, they want oil, to, to Vinny's point. Like, I want extremely oily like saturated West Coast IPA when I'm drinking them. And so, um, you know, I would sit up here and end up repeating a lot of what they both said. I mean, these products, my evolution, you know, East Coast IPA continues to still have a lot of incognito in the whirlpool and tons of cryo on the hot side and, and on, the, on the cold side. But I find that cryo doesn't do what I want it to do with West Coast styles. And so we have converted to a lot of hyperboost specifically is the product that I really, really love. And we utilize that. I mean, that is such an intensely concentrated product that the calculations sometimes are mind boggling for me to get right. Um, but utilizing that on the hot and cold side has been um, something that we have changed dramatically in the last four to five months um, to allow us to make West Coast IPAs that we, that we consider to be, um, you know, in line with, with the, keeping up with the Joneses, right? Like, I don't know how to say that any better. <laughs> like, you know, I feel like everybody's chasing Green Cheek and, and North Park. You know, I, I, Kelsey came down this summer and shared some of their beers and I was like, holy shit, I got to get, I got to get it together, uh, you know, to try to, to try to keep up. You know, it's, it's hard to try to knock every style out of the park when you have a wide portfolio of products and you're trying to put all your energy into staying, you know, on the cutting edge of technology and the hop industry specifically. But to Vinny's point, like stability, early presentation, like 
there was a time where East Coast brewers were okay with their IPA sucking for two weeks in a can, and then they were like, oh, these really peak two weeks later. I'm like, my customers are showing up on release day and opening these cans, y'all, and drinking them. So trying to ensure that you found products that would not only maintain long-term stability, but allow you to present your beer on day one just as clean and, and balanced and having the back-end mouthfeel that you want in saturation. And I think that these concentrations have allowed you to reduce that green particulate and, and matter and present a beer that can taste just as good on day one as it tastes on day 38 and still be a beer you're proud of a couple months down the road sitting on the grocery shelf. Who have any questions out here? Hey, um, do you guys have a dosing rate that you like per barrel for the flowables? Yeah, uh, uh, generally speaking, we do about, we usually do one kilo per 15 barrels is kind of what we do. Um, I mean, I guess we could do that math back, but that's, uh, that's ultimately what we do. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah, we're in that same ballpark. We've used more, we've used less. Um, we also will try to not have partial bottles yeah. left over. Yeah, um, um, you know, like with the stuff from Abstracts, which is cold side only. It's not a hot side product, the Quantum Bright. Uh, that stuff um, is a little more concentrated. Um, I mean, there it's a half an ounce to one ounce of the Quantum Bright in a liquid form will yeah. replace a pound per barrel of dry hop. So we're talking like ultra concentrated uh, stuff. Um, like with that stuff too, you need to re-CO2 the bottle afterwards. You need to purge it, purge the air out. So there is some some stuff there. Like I said, that that stuff you as home brewers can purchase, albeit it's in a four ounce jar. That's the smallest size, but uh, Roy, Roy Farms has it on their website and they have all the main varieties. Uh, you don't see the full name, it'd be like, Simcoe would be Sim, uh, Cascade would be CAS, so on and so forth. We'll get back to more of the Direct Fire Q&A in a minute, but first, experience distinct transparency and juiciness with Omega Yeast's Daybreak 5. Using their Lumina technology, Omega genetically eliminated haze in the popular British 5 strain, allowing you to preserve the fruit-boosting prowess while achieving crystal clarity perfect for modern West Coast IPAs. Learn more at info at omegayeast.com. And keep your brewery running smoothly with five-star chemicals. Their cleaning solutions are specifically formulated to meet the unique needs of breweries, ensuring that your equipment stays clean and free of harmful bacteria and contaminants. From cleaning fermenters to kegs, they've got a solution for every step of the brewing process. Use Five Star Chemicals today and taste the difference in your brews. Also, can seams should not just be handled by the OEM. Relying on outside help to confirm your product is shelf ready puts your final product and your bottom line at risk. Take back control with RSS Macklin. They provide the training and resources breweries of all sizes need to ensure the exceptional quality of your product remains the same from beginning to end. For more information, visit rssmacklin.com. That's rssmaclin.com or email service at rssmacklin.com. Now back to the Q&A. I'll throw another one out. Um, body in West Coast IPA. Uh, we've seen a lot of malt changes some of those get driven by what your local preferences by consumers. Some of them are driven, obviously, by influence from the West Coast. We're seeing that Southern California push more and more towards Pilsner malt and light, 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 uh, and getting that as absolutely pale as possible. Um, obviously, in a warm climate like Florida, drinkability and having a light body becomes this, you know, the same kind of benefit. How has that approach to body? But at the same time, you've got to support these pretty – resiny intense you know uh concentrated hops how uh, chris what how do you you know how, where have you been pushing to balance those things um that's actually it's a really good question it's actually something i think on ipa i probably think about the body character and character uh, of the texture probably more often than the hops these days um in florida uh to that note i would say Generally speaking, our customer, and namely this is because like the market is this way, like there aren't a ton of say, you know, a, sort of the new age West Coast IPAs where I am. Like there aren't just 100% Pilsner malt IPAs that are dominating. The majority of the IPAs that do well around us, obviously you guys have heard of Highlight. 
um, made a lot of that beer. <laughs> that's a, that was, that's a big one for our area and it's, it's very fundamental and like a, a foundational kind of character. It has a lot more body than, than, than say like the new West coast IPAs. Um, we make those and they do well, but I think our customer is used to a little bit more texture. Um, they do like hazy IPAs and, you know, sort of East coast, uh, character as well. So we do find that when we make sort of these, these lighter bodied West coast IPAs, uh, they, again, they do well, but our market generally wants something with a little more heft to it. So we find that adding things like, you know, we've done, we've, we've done it with wheat, we've done it with care pills, we've done it with, you know, or care foam, whichever one, just to kind of give a little more oomph to it. And then we'll sprinkle in some that have like even less body. And sometimes we'll go further. Like I mentioned, this one we just did has a little bit of flaked rice in it. And that actually is to lighten it up even further than just a hundred percent Pilsner malt. Um, all kind of taken somewhat of an idea from sort of the cold IPA texture, you know, getting it really, really light. Um, but it, it was still, you know, an IPA. We didn't uh, ferment it with lager yeast or any of that process. But the idea is that we're almost trying to uh, play with extremes on our tap list. You know, things that have maybe a lot of texture and like our hazy beers. Uh, Sunshine City is our number one seller. It's like four, over 40% of what we make. And that beer has um, a little bit of carapils and a little bit of C10 as well in it. And that is actually what our market really likes. They liked having a little bit of color, a little bit of body to it. And then we'll make these super pale sort of lighter ones and they do well, but they're not, haven't caught on completely yet. And ultimately I just think our market doesn't have a lot of them available for that to, you know, catch on just yet. Um, so we, we play around with texture a lot. I actually find that becomes a more significant change in a, a, for a customer when they come to our tap tap list and they see in our tasting room, five, six different IPAs, there's arguably, I personally think, more difference in the texture and the body than there are in, say, the hop presence and character from that. Because, yeah, we can use all these different hops in different one of different, you know, beers, but the real expression to me is, like, the, the texture of those beers. How about you, Doug? Yeah, I would, um, I would call Burial a max attenuation brewery. Uh, I... Uh, I, I I don't enjoy RS and I don't like from a from the standpoint of what could give you texture, sugar is certainly one of those, having residual sweetness. And I remember the the IPAs I grew up with were three Play Doh finished gravity beers. You know, were ten, twelve. That was like the ultimate target. Our IPAs go to like ten oh four. They're like one Play Doh, uh, West Coast. And I think that that's like extremely important to me for a lot of reasons. One, from a drinkability standpoint, that's what I want. I want dry, crisp. I don't want any back end to fight against the hops and the oils. Um, I get all of our body from, from oils. Like that is something like I will fight my brewers on low alpha versus high alpha all the time. When they submit recipes that are like really low alpha focused, I'm like, try again, try again. And we're going to try to get as much oil as possible on that to balance that high attenuation, low gravity finish. Uh, to maintain drinkability and to still have that coating resinous feature that I will never forget from the first time I went to a fresh hop festival and decided to start making beer like that, that memory will last in the imprint of what we do at burial for forever, as long as I live. So, um, balancing high attenuation, which really started for us, not only from drinkability, but like, because I, I absolutely hate and despise biotransformation and I wanted my beers to never have the, the risk of that. And so when we started making West coast again on a higher scale, the goal was max attenuation, dry them out as much as possible, blow the oil through the roof to balance out that ma- mouthfeel. And I like that drinkability, um, experience and i think that that most of our customers have have grown accustomed to that despite the fact that it is very different than our east coast ipas how about you Vinny? yeah obviously so, planning the for present is a different approach to body and a more evolved kind of, well i shouldn't say evolved yeah. well let's we won't don't need to be linear linear about this it is a different approach that you may take with some other beers yeah especially compared to regular planning the elder um i'd say Starting with the malt thing, um, we haven't leaned into as much going that Pilsner malt with that modern, like, you know, we, we don't have crystal malt in our IPAs. It hasn't for many, many years, but we still are mostly two row 
silo malt from from RAR, uh, their their craft blend, um, which does give it a little more color than a Pilsner malt, gives us a little more body. I think for our beers, it actually works uh, better. Um, just gives us uh, that mouthfeel that that we want at the right level. We've, we're finishing about two to two and a half Play-Doh uh, for for our IPAs. Um, but yeah, the and, and maybe we'll do a blend of Pilsner and uh, two row silo malt, but we're almost never doing all Pilsner malt. Um, that's partly from a flavor standpoint. I think it maybe leaves the beer a little bit too light in body. Um, and the two row gives us a little more umph. Um, but to be honest with you, um, and this rarely gets talked about, it becomes a cost thing. We're a, you know, 45,000 barrel a year brewery. Um, we can't use, uh, a Pilsner malt that's over twice the cost of our silo malt. And we've been able to make our silo malt work. And, uh, and so that's, and, and honestly, we probably have more control over the silo malt. We know what varieties of barley are going into it. And we know all the details about these barley varieties. Um, so that's, that's the approach. So when you drink the planning for president tomorrow night here at the brewer's retreat. That's all uh, two row with some wheat. One of the guys mentioned wheat. That's a great way to not only add a little bit of body back to the beer. And I think uh, it's one of the things you're seeing with a lot of West Coast IPA now. Um, but also, you know, you're not adding so much wheat that it's going to a hazy IPA, but it is giving you that uh that property of that oil coating uh, feature like you get in a hazy East Coast IPA by maybe being at eight or 10 percent wheat, something like that. Like I think planning for president is maybe five to eight percent wheat. Um, we're also still big proponents of sugar, just adding dextrose sugar to dry it out um, and then using those oils, just like Doug suggested, but I will uh, add, and I briefly mentioned it earlier, you need T90 pellets, regular pellets. You're gonna get mouthfeel and body that way. Um, I've had beers that from really well-known uh, breweries that make amazing IPAs of tested stuff that was literally like all cryo, with some 702 or whatever, one of the advanced hot products, and it's just missing that mouthfeel. And a lot of that would probably be contributed to the polyphenols mm -hmm. from the hops. And the polyphenols are bound in the green matter that you get in the T90 pellets, regular hop pellets. So if you're going to start going down the road of using some of these advanced hop, hop products or even just concentrated hops, T45, Cryo, CGX, whatever the brand name is, um, you still want to have at least 50% of your dry hop bill be T90. Uh, now, that's not to say you can't go less than that. We we actually do on a beer or two, but but not by much. We're still using enough T90 to carry mouthfeel. Yeah, I, I never clarified that, but Maybe, hopefully you caught that on my fresh hop comment. Like I, I adore green matter. I also understand it enough to know that, that it needs to be buffered. And so I, I don't think that we probably make a beer that's, that's not 60% green matter at least or so. Um, just to make that clear to everybody. If you, if you really wanted to do something fun as a home brewer and you want to learn about these things, you know, because you're not brewing as much, you literally could just brew a super basic beer let's say with Warrior. It's a hop that I like because it's ultra clean, but pick your favorite and then split, let's say it's a five gallon batch. You could split that into five, one gallon, you know, whatever jars or jugs, whatever you have, and then just do a bench top dry hop. And that will give you these aromatics and you could do an all cryo, all CGX, whatever the brand is of concentrated hops, T45 and do T90s, do a blend, and you can really see the difference and really learn what we're talking about here. More in a sec, but first, Indie Hops breeds new hop varieties to help brewers captivate beer lovers. Brewers worldwide trust Indie's unique varieties, Strata, Lorian, Luminosa, Meridian, and Audacia, to modernize, brighten, and diversify their beer lineup. Indie also offers classics that thrive in Oregon terroir, such as Chinook, Crystal, and Sterling, thoughtfully crafted and selected hops to meet your brewing needs. Visit IndieHops.com slash podcast 
to discover what's new in hop flavors. Indie Hops, life is short, let's make it flavorful. And Berkeley Yeast, founded by bioengineers. Yeast that's designed to improve flavor, quality, and consistency, increase efficiency, and save you money. If you've been following Yeast, I'm sure you've heard about their strains, Super Bloom strains, make classic hops flavors. Fresh strains keep diastole low, even with large hop additions. Tropic strains make a tropical bouquet reminiscent of the finest Southern Hemisphere hops, and they just dropped new strains that are even more futuristic. Nationwide free shipping, mention this podcast for 20% off your first order. Also, if you appreciate the precision and craftsmanship of wood-aged craft beer, you've got to check out the Festival of Wood and Barrel-Aged Beer this November. The two-day festival and competition is the largest of its kind in North America, bringing more than 150 of the world's top brewers to the heart of Chicago. Sample more than 350 one-of-a-kind barrel-aged beer, cider, mead, and perry from 13 style categories and cheer on your favorite breweries as they compete for top honors in the nationally recognized competition. It's all happening at the Festival of Wood and Barrel Aged Beer in Chicago, November 22nd, 23rd. Grab your crew, get your tickets now at fobab.com. That's F O B A B.com. All right, let's get back to the QA session. Uh, first question is just broadly speaking, thoughts on water profile. And then the second, question is um especially with regards to like the fact that they're coming out with new types of hops like it feels like dozens a year but a lot of them seem slated for more of the like the new england style uh very fruit forward you know what are some um maybe less utilized hops for like a west coast style that you might uh advocate for that people don't really you know think fall into like the tradition i'll uh i'll take that second the question about unusual hops um Super underrated hop that we use um, that was technically bred for lager brewing because it's got like some German heritage, but it does have a little cascade bred, bred into it. It's Crystal. I uh, was just just talking with Jason Perkins from Allagash here about Crystal. Um, it's an amazing hop. Uh, we use it in some of our hoppy beers. Blind Pig uh, has it. And um, Crystal will give you this beautiful grapefruit quality to it. Um, it's nice too, cause it's a little less expensive than all the newer designer hops, but it's one that you'd never think about. Um, but it will give you a beautiful, uh, grapefruit, uh, quality. And, you know, I know you, you mentioned a lot of new hops that are more East coast hazy focused. Um, we've always been driven by like citrus driven flavors. And although we do make a hazy, it's only like 2% of our production. We make well, a beer called Happy Hops. It's our, it's our not so hazy, hazy IPA. So, uh, and it's got all that fruity tropical stuff, but everything else we're super citrus driven. I've been looking for a citrus hop forever and Siegel Ranch just uh, bred a hop called Tangier. I, I brought some that everyone can can rub. Um, come come by uh, our, our brew kit today, and we'll we'll have some. Uh, it's got this beautiful orange quality to it. It'll be a couple years before it gets available to home brewers because it's a very small amount of it. Um, partially too, we bought almost all of it. <laughs> Thanks, Benny. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, but look for it. Tangier is amazing. It's got this beautiful, you know, like you have a citra, uh, uh, orange and you cut into it and you have that quick second of that burst of aromatics of orange, that little spray of acid, like that's what it smells like. And it carries through and in, into the beer. So there are some really unique, uh, hops coming out that aren't tropical fruity. Um, you just, you just got to look for them. And it might take a couple years to get to the homebrew community. You want to take the water? Uh, or the hops. I want to talk about hops. Uh, I'll talk about both. But uh, Siegel, uh, really quickly, I mean, like Crystal is like, like every brewer adores Crystal. It always comes up as this random like hop that you want to pop a little bit of into everything. It has this like notion of being kind of like green tea, bright, like hop flowers right off the, the, off the uh, field. And so I feel like that one is, it's funny how often that one comes up amongst brewers. Um, Siegel's, Siegel's uh, Hop Ranch, if you ever get to a point where you get to visit a Hop Ranch and go to their experimental fields, it's like one of the most fun experiences in all beers, uh, in all beer making. They, they um, um, 
you know, cross pollinate all types of different stuff. They're constantly trying to come up with new ideas. And like every year I go in there and there's like three that I'm like, holy crap, how did you get eucalyptus and coconut into a hop? So there's, there's always, um, I, I find that, that these hop growers that are constantly trying to, to, um, get brewer feedback on experimental or doing really cool stuff. And one that comes from them and I, I'm 90% sure that I have the name right in my head, but I have so much fried brain right now. Uh, <laughs> it, it's Zumo. Is that Zumo. right? Zumo? Yeah, yeah. Zumo has been probably my, my favorite new hop of the last two years because it's just such a diverse hop that could make anything from a light lager to a great Pilsner to a great West Coast IPA. Probably even has application on East, East Coast side, but it, it's got enough zesty and like pop that I think it's, it's much more uh, ready for your Pilsners and West Coast IPAs. There's uh, Zumo in planning for president when you guys get oh, to try it. So, yeah. Um, so that hop's amazing. Um, I, you know, to his point, he was talking about like German varietal. There's a, there's a hop called Grungeist that we use a lot in West Coast IPA, especially in West Coast Pilsner. If, if you've messed with Grungeist at all, it's a super low alpha hop, but it has like enough roundness to be diverse and, and work in that application as well. Um, as far as water goes... Uh, us in Asheville, like everybody, everybody's like, uh, New Belgium, Sierra Nevada, and Oscar Blue, everybody's moving there because the water's so great. Well, the water's just like really clean. It doesn't have a unique water table. It's pretty much zeros across the board. It's, it, there's, it's, it, it's soft as hell. And so that's wonderful because it's just empty, empty palette and water. This is, you know, a weird time for me to be up here talking about water in Asheville. Yeah. Um, so, uh, bear with me. <laughs> Um, water was very abundant in Asheville when all, when everybody came in and, um, and, uh, it's, uh, it's a water that I miss and I'm now tanking in water to make beer in Asheville. And so that has made me think about water a lot lately and having to like build it back. Um, we actually looked for a municipal source that was close to Asheville that had almost an identical water table. And we found one about an hour and 20 minutes away in a town called Cleveland that has been tanking in water for a lot of the, the smaller breweries. We were, um, we test cased that two weeks ago. And so we had to figure out how to build it back to the profiles that we wanted. Um, we still are like not high hardness at all. Like we're not like crazy and doing anything like, you know, um, that would be, a like extreme overkill, but we're, we're definitely not soft. And I think that like that old notion of like two to one sulfate or two to one, the other way for like East coast to be like chlorides to sulfates or sulfates to chlorides. Like we are actually pretty balanced anymore. We're almost more one to one. I would say like one and a half to one. Maybe, uh, our sulfates are probably like in the, uh, 150 range and the chlorides are always above 100. Like we, we've gotten to that point where we want that little bit of, of back end mouthfeel. The bicarbonate's staying up there in the somewhere between 100 and 200 as well. But we don't go to an intense level at all with anything, even when we make loggers where we might, you know, you might feel inclined to try to do some weird um, British, Belgian, German, you know, high hard water profile. We try to keep it balanced because we want an identity to our beers. To, to feel um, Asheville. Sometimes it's, it's weird to, to bemoan the fact that your water is so boring. Hmm. And uh, now I, I really respect and appreciate <laughs> that abundant, boring water that we have and the fact that it has always allowed us to, to create a palette for whatever we want uh, the beer to turn out like. Doug's comment about uh, the chloride and mouthfeel goes back to that first early conversation you know, 10, 20 minutes ago about light finish, finishing your beer with a low gravity, you know, low terminal gravity, but then you can add some of that body back yeah. using chloride. And I'm sure that's probably a part of burials Huge. recipe and signature. Um, we have leaned more into chloride as we've uh, become better at water chemistry and brewing at, at Russian river. And we're probably about the same range kind of, you know, I don't know our exact numbers, but we've leaned a lot more in the chloride to add mouthfeel with these dry beers. So it's really kind of taking that East coast, hazy IPA technique of using chloride to add body and mouthfeel through water, not as high of course, but giving you what you need and then just monkeying around with it. Then to be honest with you, we don't, we don't look at that ratio hard and fast, like, oh, it's a 1.75 to one ratio. Once we have a beer, 
uh, Garrison, our, our head brewer, and I are just like, hey, you know what? It has a little too much. Let's just take half a pound out. Like We're not looking at uh, specific and then the next time we drink it's like yeah that's right or now nah, let's take another half pound out or nah, that was too far quarter pound back in you know i mean that's that's just simpler for us to do it real time you can get wrapped up in numbers too much and you know at the end of the day your sensory is your best palate whether you're a home brewer or or a pro brewer uh, as far as water profile at Green Bench, um, I, pretty similar to Doug, I, I always kind of felt from the beginning that that was like I, I wanted there to be like a Green Bench profile a bit. So we do kind of use a similar profile. We definitely change it depending on what we're doing, but it's fairly similar across the range of beers that we make. Um, we're fairly soft, like our water. We have hard water that comes in. Um, but a uh, little dirty secret, we soften our water and we do use um, an ion exchange with, with uh, sodium. And I do think actually our, our threshold levels of sodium is a major factor in our beers. I think something about our beers that I've always felt like, and this definitely comes across in say our mixed firm beers um, uh, eventually <laughs> after a couple years in barrels and, and stuff, there's a savoriness to our beers that I find on the back end that increases our drinkability to me that like I finish it and then I, I got, I want to drink another one, another sip right away. And I do think it's like levels of salt, actual sodium, um, that we have in our water profile from the water softener. Um, because we've also used it without that. And you can definitely like, I find the, the back end to not be as, as savory. Like I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not craving it as much, you know, on that next sip. Um, generally speaking, we're about one to one as well. Chloride to sulfate sulfates. We don't like, we will, we actually, the one thing that we change probably more than anything else is bicarbonate. Like some of our beers will go pretty high bicarb kind of depending on what we're making. Um, you know, we do also a lot of lager. And so if I'm making say export lager, we go pretty heavy on our, on our carbonates, uh, for that beer and a lot of our other sort of, um, Bavarian sort of uh, focused beers specifically. Um, the softness also works really well in like say Saison. Uh, we find that the ones that get super, super dry again, create this heavy savoriness that like just makes me want to keep drinking it. Um, there was something else I was going to say on that. And now I, I lost it. Uh, I'll move to the hop question then. Uh, bef- and if this comes back, I'll, I'll, I'll hop in. Um, for hops, uh, one of them, obviously, I'm a I'm a fan of of crystals. Well, Grungeist is actually something we were talking about. I think I was talking to Avery yesterday about it uh, as a hop that I've always really liked. A few years ago, we made actually we were doing like a series of hazy IPAs, and we did an all German hop one, uh, and I really really liked it. And it was Grungeist, um, Hill Melon, and Halletal Blanc. So sort of these new age fruity versions, but they're still you know grown in the Halletal. Um, love that hop. Uh, a hop that I think, um, I, I don't know if it's a secret. I don't necessarily know, but I like at like a 10 to 20%, usually around that 15% in a lot of dry hops is CTZ. Um, if I mean, I really, really like that hop. And I like, what I like about it is, um, well, depending on where you get it and there's a lot of factors involved with that one. But what I like about the CTZ that we have um, that we'll select is it provides kind of a like a balance to whatever we're adding. So say you have these really fruity hops, it'll give you a little bit of structure on the back end of like a little bit of resin, a little bit of like kind of old school flower kind of character. Um, And then on the flip side, if I'm doing something that's maybe a little more um, sort of, you know, dank, I mean, it, it just adds like another baseline punch of like, here's the standard. And then we go beyond that on sort of its dankness level. If we're trying to say make, a very dank, like West coast IPA, for example. Um, yeah, that other thing didn't come to me yet. So I think that's, and and I'll add, uh, you know, we're talking West coast, American IPA, whatever you want to call it here, uh, is bitterness is like, that's a key part of, you know, IPA, uh, West coast IPA. I know that's not the direction of a, a hazy East coast style, but you know, when Chris was just talking about, that craving to have another sip to me a big part of that it is water chemistry but it's bitterness and you know there's there's been an assault on bitterness from brewers over the last few years um even on the podcast on occasion you hear and there's nothing wrong with that it's the great thing about craft beer but like it's like ah you know i never liked bitterness and um 
And for me, that's always been one of the most appealing parts of West Coast IPA is that clean, crisp bitterness. And, you know, now that we're, you know, I think we're more technical as brewers, all of us, you know, we're now using, we're leaning on pH. So if you want it to be a little more coarse and get more bitterness out, you could run your boil at a higher pH, say like 5.4 or even 5.5, and you can uh, probably get better extraction utilization. But if you want a cleaner bitterness, maybe you're down at like 5 or 5.1, something like that. There's no right or wrong answer here. Um, there is some been some research that the, slightly higher pH during the boil will uh, reduce your fan a little bit. Uh, the fan, fear amino nitrogen, which is uh, really only used for yeast health, and then anything left over becomes an oxidative uh, issue in your beer oxidative product uh, to, to, you know, create oxidation. So there is you know, we're always looking at that too, but just don't, don't forget about bitterness on these beers. And uh, really f learn about pH and focus on on pH. We're taking pH all the way through our our process multiple times during the boil. You know, starting with the mash, the boil, and really leaning into this uh, range that I just mentioned. Whether it's five point four boiling at five, five point one. Yeah, I would I would add bit bitter is my favorite flavor. Uh, I'm so I'm so glad that like yeah to his point like. Brewers ruined bitterness for a while. It was like the East Coast, the rise of East Coast and the success of that, and then the competition to make the best East Coast, it, it, it's like it, it sadly infected our West Coast for a while, where we're like, well, people really like these smoother, softer beers. West Coast IPA never went away in Sonoma County. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Our, uh, our uh, you know, pretend West Coast world in North Carolina. Uh, we're on the West Coast of North Carolina, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you have a West Coast you know, brewery there called Sierra Nevada. Yeah, so. that's true, that's true. But, um, you know, it, it, we, everybody reduced the bitterness of those beers uh, for a while. And, you know, at some point, there was just we were all just like, these aren't good. Like, this is just not the same drinking experience. And if you adore bitterness the way I do, like I drink botanical everything every day. That's, I want that grip. I want that pull at the back end of my palate. And I think that, um, you know, every – opportunity I've had over the last four weeks as I reopened bars in Asheville and my partner Tim and I had bartended and we saw people face to face again I was reminded that customers want that again they were all like I want something bitter I want to be kicked in the back of my <laughs> my throat uh and I love that and so you know we have over the last year just steadily kept going up and up and up and we're back up to I think where we probably were 12 years ago when we started brewing cool. Yeah. yeah, I guess to, to jump on the bitter train, um, I also really love bitterness. I've always found my, my palate, although I've used this word, I have a savory palate. I, I like salt, acid, heat, and bitter. Like those are my, I'm not a, not as big of a sweets fan um, myself. I don't, it's easy to kind of give that up for me because it, it doesn't do the same thing as say like salt and bitterness do. Um, so I've always been a fan of that. I think on our, on our IPAs, um, West Coast, we're generally finishing kind of right where, where Vinny is, like a two to two and a half Play-Doh final gravity. Um, and then we're usually shooting for at usually right around a like a one or so BUG ratio um, as far as like our bitterness level. That has dipped down to closer to like, you know, 0. 0.6 as our, on like kind of the low end. If it's like a pale ale, sometimes it'll be as low as like 0. 0.5, 5.55. But generally we're at about, a one, which is a fairly, you know, say you have a, you know, 1050 beer, it's 50 IBUs essentially. Right. So, um, we'll go that high as far as like most of those, um, and perception wise, kind of a lot of the, I guess, research in the last few years, something that we've been focused on is kind of seeing exactly how much bitterness is really picked up in our process later on, you know, so our dry hop bitterness, um, has completely, and really that's because of hazy IPAs, like because of like more of the East coast thing, um, playing around with how much, you know, hot, hot side, you know, matter we're adding versus cold side. I mean, we've gotten to a point where on a lot of these hazy IPAs, we're literally adding nothing in the boil, like nothing. And we're just dry hopping the shit out of it. And then testing the BUs in lab afterwards and seeing like, oh, damn, this is like there's 40 IBUs, you know, in lab. Um, and it did taste more balanced, you know, for a hazy IPA. Um, but seeing how much we pick up on that versus how much we pick up in a West Coast IPA, they're not 
exactly the same, but there is a decent amount that you pick up um, in those. So a lot of that's just experimenting and trial and error on how much you want to add here and there, you know, versus like a a first word or a 60 or a 70 minute or so kind of addition um, versus like how much do you want to put at the beginning? You know, do you want to put 10, 20, 30, you know, IBUs at the beginning or do you want to get like 30, 40, 50 in the late edition, and then how much are you going to pick up in dry hop? Um, that has been pretty fun. I would actually say that's probably been my the thing that I've enjoyed the most of sort of the hazy IPA um, sort of movement and, and us being able to make them is is learning how the different steps of, of hop additions have like affected the bitterness levels. One, one thing I'll add on the uh, dry hopping, because you do get bitterness from it, that as all the home brewers in the room here is make sure you're storing your hops in the freezer, not just in the cold box. Try to get as much air out of them. If you have a vacuum sealer in your kitchen, use that. Uh, there's these things called, and these guys will know this, but it's called, they're called humulinones. They're oxidized alpha acids. And so the more oxidized your hops get, the more humulinones you have. And humulinones are the bittering compounds that you get from dry hopping. And a BU test won't measure them, yep. though, on an exact basis. They're 0.65%. So if you have one isomerized alpha acid, it would be 0.65 as a humulinone. And the again, the spectrophotometer that measures BUs can't tell the difference. Yeah. So we don't even measure IBUs anymore. We measure hot side just as a guide. But um, all of it starts with storing your dry hops cold and keeping the air out of them all right we got like two more questions because the other tour group is uh, going to pop up here in a second that's if sam's tour is on time <laughs> uh, another quick two-parter uh going off of actually what we were just saying about uh bittering hops do you see a big difference between first word or just doing like six minute additions uh or does any distinction there go away from all the uh later hops and second if you don't if a little bit of a tangent uh uh, can you talk a little bit about approaches to dark IPAs in a West Coast tradition and kind of hop selection that works with darker and roasted malts if you're going away from the super, super pale? Uh, I think to hop on the first work question real quick, um, I, I do sensorily like can tell generally a, a, a change, but I do think it kind of goes back to something Vinny was saying. Your pHs matter a lot, I think, with first wort. So like making sure that you know, you're applying the right pH for the character that you're looking for on a first word hop, I think is is arguably the most important part of that process um, versus, say, a, a standard bitterness. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the 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 idea that a first word is like a softer bitterness. I, I don't necessarily know if I like 100 percent subscribe to that as much as like how the pH of that addition really affects the level of bitterness that you get on those. Yeah, I mean, on that question, I I differ. I mean, from a sensory standpoint, like because of what they both just said about like measuring BUs, like we we kind of gave up. I mean, it's nice to it's nice to understand mm -hmm. what you can measure and try to use it as a baseline. But sensory tells the tale, and we we have a very very advanced, very deep sensory program, and the feedback is used to adjust constantly. And so, I think that's really important. And and so, as we removed first wort or 60 minute hopping from like 80 percent of our beers like we just don't do that in either one of those practices in most of the beers that we make since we make so many hoppy beers um, but in this ones that we still do we from a century standpoint decided that we really did not see a difference and that it was much more advantageous to just do the 60 minute hopping so we could manage our ph a little bit easier and so that's essentially what's happened at burial um with with loggers and some in some saisons and some of the styles where we still do that early hopping yeah i'll go to that second question we don't make a dark like a black ipa kind of thing i'm not sure if these guys do but i will say that just conceptually you know you're going to be having the hop let's just say the bitterness you know and then you're going to really want to look at that you know acid contribution from the dark malts you know maybe you want to be focused on like debittered dehusked uh dark malts to get the color um i mean if you really want to just you could use the wireman cinnamar mm -hmm. as a coloring agent and um and and use that but i would be really focused on that correlation between the dark malts and the hops to make sure you don't have 
too much of that bitterness or that acrid flavor or whatnot that then would be kind of a train wreck of, of flavors. But again, I, I can't speak with uh, any experience there. I, um, you know, we moved to Asheville from Seattle and we like Asheville, we consider the Northwest of the East. And so, uh, you know, most of us still do love the CDA style. Um, you know, we wish our customers did. So we don't get to make a lot of it, but every winter we still do make a lot of those. those dark. Honestly, I, I have openly told people the Black IPA is my favorite style of beer. If I could drink any style of beer in any moment with any feeling, it would probably be that because I adore the combination of, of, of roasted malt and hops and trying to marry those two, which I think is 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 almost always best accomplished through like traditional sea hops and Simcoe. Like mm-hmm. those those kind of resinous citrusy hops seem to work. Like I always tell people it's like it's a roasted bone. Like that's what I'm going for. A joint. Like a roasting joint. Like the the, the smell of roasted cannabis is like what I'm going for always. And so we're we're trying to replicate the notion of that through the citrusy quality citrusy and resinous and piney qualities of just traditional sea hops almost always. Um, uh, similar to Doug, I, I like black IPAs. I've, I've made, I made them years ago, obviously when you could, <laughs> um, I don't now because we don't, can't do, we don't sell them. Um, but I remember one of the beers that I felt like there's like a hand, there's like a few that I remember being like sort of changed me a little bit or I was like, holy shit, like I don't know anything. And one of them was sublimely self-righteous from stone. And I remember, thinking I finally knew my shit because I, you know, had spent a lot of time learning how to judge and understanding styles and brewing. And I grabbed this bottle off the shelf at Total Wine and I was like, cool. It just said like American Dark Ale, I think is all it said at the be- at, at the beginning. And I didn't know what that meant necessarily, but popped it open and poured it and it was black and it smelled. And I was like, oh, it's going to be like roasty and chocolatey and all this stuff. And I smell it and I'm like, whoa, that smells like, like weed. Like it smells like, it smells like a forest and pine and like, citrus and like how the fuck and then i go to drink it and it blew my mind i was just like i I, how did they do this and i I remember being so intrigued with like how to figure that out um that my favorite hop still today it's i mean it's still arguably probably my still my favorite hop overall is simcoe and i always found that simcoe was the best hop for those for that kind of beer at least when i brewed them um i do like azaka as well i find a combination of simcoe and azaka are really good in sort of that style, you know, but again, I haven't made one in a while. Um, but I, 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 I get away with sometimes just trying to make like a hoppy porter at the brewery and calling it that <laughs> just to kind of, you know, I was going to say, we make like, we make a house beer called light grinder. It's a, we market it as American Porter. It's yeah. a black IPA. Yeah. Like we, <laughs> yeah. we, I just got so tired of people crapping on black IPA and I was like, we're going to make them and we're going to trick all of you <laughs> and lie to you. We're like, it's like a West coast Porter, but that's what it is. And we love that beer and it's probably the most consumed beer in our tap room by, by people in the industry. Yeah. You heard it here first. West Coast Porter. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, got one more question. I think uh, before the other group pops up here. Yeah, sort of a sort of a general question on dry hop process in terms of uh, you know contact time and rousing the tank, dumping the tank, getting the hops off. But also a, a specific question about dry hopping. One thing I've experienced is, uh, on, I'm talking about it on a homebrew scale here, with an actual conical fermenter is. Uh, heavily dry hopping hops concentrating in the cone and uh you know when you're getting a little bit of that refermentation hop creep uh, actually quite a quite a temperature stratification inside the fermenter there Did you experience that as well mm. on the scale that we're at not really because our cones have yeah. glycol on them so definitely one of the advantages of you know being a, a pro brewer um you know i would i would be looking at just trying to dump your cone every day if if you can and uh, see if you can get it out try to do it slow you know one of the big issues is it's sticking you know to the cone um, I think there's just some things you just got to have to kind of live with um, and you know I, I would I will say that so you are able to drop the temperature I assume there is some glycol or some chilling on it and one thing I would suggest is Uh, adjusting your pH. I've talked about this on the podcast before. We're using food grade phosphoric acid to adjust the pH. Uh, That lowers the pH. Then we add the dry hops and maybe even a little ALDC to combat the the diacetyl. Um, But that lower pH will then counter 
the rise in pH, which you're going to get from dry hopping, which works out to be about 0.1 to 0.14 um, pH scale per pound per barrel of dry hop. So if you're dry hopping at five pounds per barrel, you could see a 0.5 increase, 0.4 point. I mean, it would be pretty uh, significant. So, and the problem is, is that your yeast has trouble retaking up the diacetyl, the VDK, at the higher pH, which is why we want to drop it in the first place. But if you make this drop, you can then crash your tank more quickly once you do get through hop creep. And that will also just help push the uh, hops to the cone. Even if you can't get them all out, at least you're moving the process along more quickly and your beer isn't just sitting there on the hops in the cone where you've got the stratification that, you know, I mean, short of putting it, you know, in a refrigerator or something. So. That is all we have time for. The other tour group is finished. Uh, thank you, Chris, Doug, and Vinny for your uh, thoughts on brewing West Coast and American IPA. There it is, the first of two direct fire Q&A sessions recorded live with audience questions from our brewer's retreat earlier this week at Dogfish Head. Thanks to these three brewers, as well as all the other feature brewers like Jason Perkins of Allagash, Neil Fisher of Weldworks, Avery Swanson of Keeping Together, Henry from Monkish, Kelsey McNair of North Park, Steve Parker from Fiden, Scott Janish from Sapwood Cellars, and of course, of course, Sam Calgione, plus the dynamic duo of Mark Safrick and Brian Selders from Dogfish Head, who provided crucial brewing support and are fermenting those beers we made right now. We'll be back next week with more, but first, choose GD Chillers on your next expansion or brewery startup and receive one free year of remote control and monitoring. ProBrew offers two to four week lead time on in stock rotary can fillers and seamers. Old Orchard is your go to source for fruit forward ingredients for some of the biggest names in the craft brewing landscape. Omega Yeast Daybreak 5 gives you juicy modern hop flavors without the haze. Five star chemicals, cleaning solutions are specifically formulated to meet the unique needs of breweries. Take back control of your canning and seaming with the experts at RSS Macklin. Trust Indie Hop's unique varieties to modernize, brighten, and diversify your beer lineup. Berkeley yeast strains are designed to improve flavor, quality, and consistency. And check out the Festival of Wooden Barrel Aged Beer this November 22nd and 23rd in Chicago. If you've enjoyed this episode or any others, go to beerandbrewing.com, click on that subscribe button, and show us just how much you care. But also, don't just do it for us, do it for you. There's lots lots in it for you. Uh, amazing content in the magazines that we deliver every quarter uh whether that's our brewing industry guide or craft beer and brewing magazine or hey if you're even a distiller our new annual spirits and distilling annual um we'll be back next week with yet another great episode until then cheers This podcast has been brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those who love to make and drink great beer. To learn more or to subscribe, visit beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew.